strengthening Ukraine's hand at the negotiating table. What's at stake here are the principles of freedom, the right to, determines, to determine one's own future, a right that Ukrainians have shown the world they will fight to preserve. In recent weeks, the United States has sent $300 million in humanitarian aid, tens of thousands of tons of food and medicine for displaced fam families fleeing Russia's premeditated, unprovoked, and unjustified war. U.S. humanitarian uh, aid personnel are on the ground in the region assessing needs in real time. And just as Pre President Biden pledged we would, we have also surged security assistance to our Ukrainian partners so that they can defend themselves. As Russia began its military buildup last year, the United States delivered $650 million in military equipment to Ukraine, building on a growing security cooperation uh, relationship dating back to 2014. As the conflict started, we sped $350 million more in equipment to help bolster Ukraine's defenses. Now this week, we are authorizing $1 billion more of arms and equipment, including types already used successfully by Ukraine's security forces to defend their country against Russian aggression. Today's announcement nearly doubles total security assistance to Ukraine since the beginning of the administration to more than $2 billion, enabling us to surge additional needed assistance, including anti-aircraft, anti-tank, anti-armor systems, as well as small, small arms and munitions used by Ukrainian security forces on the ground right now in their fight to defend their country. Among the items included in this new package, are 800 Stinger anti-aircraft systems, 2,000 Javelin, 1,000 light anti-armor weapons, and 6,000 AT-4 anti-armor systems, 100 tactical unmanned aerial systems, 100 grenade launchers, 500 rifles, 1,000 pistols, 400 machine guns, and 400 shotguns, uh, in addition to over 200 million rounds of small arms and ammunition and grenade launcher and mortar rounds, and more. In addition to the U.S. produced short-range air defense systems the Ukrainians have been using to great effect, the United States has also identified and is helping the Ukrainians acquire from our partners and allies additional longer-range systems on which Ukraine's forces are already trained, as well as additional munitions for those systems. The United States continues to expedite the authorization and facilitation of additional assistance to Ukraine from our allies. At least 30 countries have provided security assistance to Ukraine since the Russian invasion began. In 2022, this year, the Department of State has authorized third-party transfers of defensive equipment from more than 14 countries, a number that continues to grow as allies and partners increase their support to Ukraine. As the President said, this could be a long and difficult battle, but America will be steadfast. America will continue to answer the call. The United States, our allies and partners, we are united in supporting Ukraine in its time of need. Uh, with that, happy to take your questions. Thanks, Ben. Um, I actually uh, I have some Iran questions, but I guess we'll start with Ukraine because I think that's probably on the top of everyone's mind. Um, when you speak about additional long-range systems that you uh, longer-range systems that the Ukrainians already trained in, you're talking about the S-300s, or are you talking about is it broader than just that? And well. So, Matt, what we are doing and what I refer to now is the fact that we are continuing to pursue solutions uh, to help our Ukrainian partners acquire long-range anti-aircraft systems and the munitions they would need for those systems, uh, and the President also alluded to this in his remarks today. Uh, I can't get into the full specifics of this, but we are continuing to work with uh, our allies, with our partners, uh, to surge new assistance, and that includes Soviet or Russian origin anti-aircraft system and the necessary ammunition to employ them every day uh, to Ukraine. Uh, those are the systems on which they are already using, uh, the systems on which they are already trained and have actually demonstrated uh, great effect already. Uh, we have said that we welcome assistance from countries around the world. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, more than 30 countries across the globe have provided uh, defensive security assistance to Ukraine. The United States has, uh, the uh, Department of State, I should say, has authorized the provision of U.S. origin equipment from at least 14 uh, countries, but we know that right, many but, more standing up. But this isn't U.S. origin. That's correct. Right. That's correct. So, so without getting into the actual nitty-gritty specifics of what systems they are and what countries, although it would be nice to know what countries you're in discussions with about this, what does the U.S., if anything, have to do to facilitate the, the, the transfer uh, of, of such systems? And secondly, can you, I mean, are you close 
to reaching an agreement with any of the, the potential donor countries? What do we have to do to facilitate the transfer well, yeah, non, of non-U.S. origin well, equipment? Yeah. Uh, so, first, for U.S. origin equipment, uh, of course, there are uh, waivers that are necessary given uh, ITAR provisions and, and other applicable uh, provisions. The Secretary uh, has repeatedly, uh, with more than 14 countries, uh, authorized the provision of such U.S. origin equipment to our Ukrainian partners, and we've done so uh, on an extremely expedited uh, basis, turning those around uh, in the course of a day. When it comes to working with countries that may have Russian-made, Soviet-origin uh, equipment, obviously that is not equipment uh, for which we would need to provide any sort of waiver or any sort of formal paperwork. Uh, what we are doing, however, is sharing our assessment of the security needs uh, that our uh, Ukrainian partners have, precisely the needs they have, the threat they are under, uh, the types of fires and munitions uh, that they are enduring from uh, President Putin's forces and working with them to determine what they may have in their inventories, to marry that with what we have in our inventories, uh, with our knowledge, with their knowledge of uh, what the Ukrainians already have, uh, the training they already have, to determine uh, the most effective package that will allow them to defend themselves. Well, are you, can you say if you're close to an agreement with any or is it we, we are having these discussions every day. 30 countries around the world have already provided uh, security assistance uh, to Ukraine, uh, and we're having this discussion. Okay, and then the last one is just that and if, if, if a deal is struck, and I realize it's a hypothetical, so you probably won't answer, but let me try anyway. Uh, if, if you do get a country, country X or country Y or both X and Y to provide Ukraine with these systems, uh, is, are, are you, is the U.S. prepared to make up for those? Because, I mean, presumably if country X and Y give their, those systems to Ukraine, uh, the Russians most likely aren't going to want to sell them replacements, right? Well, I, so I, I will. So is um, the U.S. going to be, or, or any ally, are you in discussions to replace those systems that countries might give up? I, I always appreciate when you answer the question for me. I, I will note that that is uh, hypothetical. Uh, I will also note, however, uh, that uh, we have continued to provide forms of reassurance. Uh, to our allies, including our allies on the eastern flank. Uh, the Department of Defense recently spoke of the two Patriot missile batteries uh, that had been moved into Poland. Uh, we know that uh, countries that are valiantly standing up, that are providing uh, defensive weaponry from their own stocks, they too have their own security needs. Uh, when it comes to the NATO alliance, certainly we will continue to stand by our NATO allies uh, to make uh, certain that NATO has uh, the power, the capability, uh, to defend itself. Yes. Um, a quick one, I have a follow-up, but uh, there, I think there are drones in the package uh, of, uh, you know, of new equipment. I wonder if you can confirm that there are these switchblade drones are part of that and any details you can give. I've seen quite a bit of reporting uh, over the last 24 hours uh, on that particular system. I think I understand why when you uh, see the video of it. Look, I can't uh, confirm uh, particular systems the president did speak of or we did speak of tactical unmanned aerial systems. We provided uh, and are providing a hundred of those systems. Um, the system that you referred to would be an anti-armor system. It is certainly consistent uh, with the type of defensive weaponry that uh, we're providing, but I'm just not in a position to uh, to speak to all the specific systems that may be included in that package. Okay, then uh, uh, can we move on to the negotiations, discussions going on between the Ukrainians and the Russians? Sure. You know, there's some signs, uh, you know, some noises coming from both sides that they might be some movement on that. I wondered if you had a view on, on um, you know, the potential for, for an agreement there. And there's a discussion about, um, you know, an agreement that would see Ukraine kind of pledge neutrality, not join NATO, like a Sweden or Austria uh, kind of neutrality, and then also have uh, security guarantees from other countries. You know, could the U.S. be a guarantor of a, a, some kind of a, agreement like that? Well, we welcome the sentiments expressed that there is hope, that there is optimism for diplomatic progress. Uh, but what Ukraine needs now, more than sentiments, more than hope, more than optimism, uh, is de-escalation, uh, is an end to the violence, uh, is a tangible indication uh, that President Putin is changing course. Uh, and that is something we have not yet seen. And just as I was uh, coming down here, there are more horrifying uh, reports of shelling, of uh, um, 
destruction of what appear to be uh, civilian sites uh, across U Ukraine, including in Mariupol. Uh, we've made clear that we unequivocally support Ukraine's efforts uh, to achieve peace, to bring an end to the mounting uh, human suffering uh, from President Putin's war of choice. Diplomacy is always going to be at the center of these efforts. Uh, but we remain clear-eyed, as do our Ukrainian partners, as you heard from President Zelensky, as you've heard from the foreign minister, as you've heard from others. Uh, it remains our position that Russia needs to halt its campaign of death, of destruction, immediately. And we are working simultaneously to do all we can to give Ukraine the strongest hand it can have at the negotiating table. Uh, and we're doing that in a couple different ways. We've already spoken to one of those ways uh, at the top of this briefing when we detailed uh, some of the security assistance that we're providing to Ukraine, uh, $2 billion uh, over the past year, $1 billion in the past week alone. Uh, that is certainly an important element of that. Uh, the other part of that effort to strengthen Ukraine's hand at the negotiating table is what the United States and our allies and partners have uh, brought to bear on the Kremlin, on uh, the Russian Federation, uh, including its economy and its financial system. We have placed unprecedented pressure on the Russian economy, on its uh, financial system, and every day you see very tangible metrics of that. Stock market remains closed, will remain closed for at least the remainder of this week and potentially even longer, presumably in an effort to prevent capital flight. The ruble is virtually worthless. It is literally worth less than a, a penny. Uh, Russia is on the verge of default. Its credit uh, rating is at jump status. Hundreds of international companies are fleeing uh, the Russian market, and we can go on and on. Now, all of that is part and parcel uh, of our effort to strengthen that Ukrainian position. Uh, so we see Ukraine, uh, day by day, will have a stronger hand. Uh, as these measures have even more effect on the Russian economy, on the Russian financial system, and as we, together with our allies and partners here too, continue to provide Ukraine with the defensive uh, security assistance uh, that our Ukrainian partners need to defend themselves inside their own territory. Yes? Um, I just wanted to dig on that a little further, mm -hmm. um, Ned, because uh, certain export controls exist on some of these systems that the two gentlemen mentioned. And so is the State Department going to take the lead in um, talking to allies and easing those export controls or maybe changing them altogether? Um, and especially given Ukraine's desperate need, you know, how can you work through those obstacles to maybe get them their aid that they need faster, especially with export? Well, I think we have proven uh, throughout the course of this conflict and even before it that we are not going to let any sort of technical barrier stand in our way. Uh, and I have already spoken to the expedited procedures that we have used to approve the provision of U.S. origin equipment uh, to Ukraine. We have done that in many cases uh, with less than uh, 24 hours uh, notice. The fact that it was uh, just a, a couple weeks ago uh, that we announced an additional uh, $350 million in security assistance to Ukraine within four or five days more than 70% of that vast sum had already been delivered. Uh, so I think that speaks to the fact that uh, we are breaking through um, not only um, what might be otherwise burdensome uh, bureaucratic uh, processes and hoops, uh, but we are doing so uh, with alacrity. Here in this department, our colleagues at the Department of Defense uh, are doing the same. We know that our allies and partners uh, around the world are doing the same on their end precisely because we recognize the urgency with which our Ukrainian partners need these uh, defensive supplies. Uh, so if there are uh, procedures uh, that we need to uh, go through here at the department or elsewhere within the government uh, to see to it that appropriate and effective systems are provided to our Ukrainian partners, whether that is from our stocks, whether that is U.S. origin material from the stocks of our allies and partners, or uh, material that is non-U.S. origin, that uh, may even be Russian-made or Soviet origin, uh, we will uh, we will see to that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Poland's uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Kaczynski, uh, Jarosław Kaczynski, uh, was in Kiev yesterday um, along with uh, leaders of <coughs> Poland, uh, 
Czechia and Slovenia, and he called for a peacekeeping mission to Ukraine with the involvement of NATO troops. So, uh, is that something that the U.S. would be willing to entertain? Uh, and somewhat relatedly, President Zelensky uh, yesterday uh, said that he would um, like to see more leaders coming to visit him. There is, are there any chances of um, you know U.S. officials uh, doing that? So, on your first question, of course, it's not up to us to speak for NATO. Uh, what I can say uh, is uh, essentially what we have heard from uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, is that the alliance, uh, of course, is uh, squarely focused on putting an end to this war, bringing this brutal aggression to a close, just as NATO is. Uh, we are intently focused on doing the same. In the same vein, we want to avoid doing anything that would prolong this war or that would expand this war. And having American service members uh, on Ukrainian territory, American pilots in Ukrainian airspace, NATO service members uh, on Ukrainian soil, NATO pilots in Ukrainian airspace, of course, that has the potential not to bring this war to a close, but to expand uh, to something uh, that is even uh, larger uh, and much more uh, grave in terms of its implications. Uh, in terms of U.S. officials visiting Ukraine, you'll know that it was just last week that Secretary Blinken met with his uh, foreign minister, uh, counterpart Foreign Minister Kuleba, uh, on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Uh, they actually uh, conducted part of that meeting on sovereign Ukrainian soil, uh, the very sovereign, uh, very sovereignty that Ukrainians are so valiantly and bravely and courageously uh, standing up to defend. Right, but that's, you know, it's a little bit different than going to. Kiev and meeting with Zelensky, stepping across the board. I mean, not that it wasn't a symbolic show of support or anything, but there are no plans to do, to do similar to what the three European. The the White have. House has announced plans for the president oh, to go to Brussels. Yeah. Uh, that is the only I'm presidential uh, uh, travel that, I'm aware of at the moment. Okay, well, but I'm talking about lower than the president. I mean, I, I, and I, and I, just to follow up on Simon's question earlier about this idea of neutrality and security guarantees. Um, is this something, I realize that you said that what Ukraine needs right now, what they need immediately is de-escalation and a sign that Putin has changed his uh, ch changing course. But in the, in the more medium term, is this something that you guys are willing to uh, consider? Because frankly, I think a lot of us, um, including Ukraine, thought they already had security guarantees from the Budapest Memorandum. So it, is, is the U.S. ready to look at the Budapest Plus agreement that expands the number of guarantors? So this is, in terms of the diplomacy, this is not a question for us uh, regarding what might lead to a ceasefire, a diminution of violence between uh, Ukraine and Russia. This is ultimately a question for our Ukrainian partners to decide, uh, to decide the terms of diplomacy, what they are willing to pursue, what they are not willing to pursue. This is really at the heart of uh, this conflict, uh, this needless war of aggression uh, that President Putin and his forces are waging. They are waging this war precisely because they sought to deprive Ukraine of its sovereign rights, its sovereign right to determine its own foreign policy, its sovereign right to determine uh, its own Western orientation, its sovereign right to choose uh, its own partners uh, and alliances. Uh, so as part and parcel of that, it is not for us to say uh, the terms by which Ukraine and Russia may uh, be in a position to reach an agreement that we all hope uh, could diminish the violence. Uh, that is for Ukraine to decide. We will be standing by our Ukrainian partners, uh, assisting them with the diplomacy, as we know a number of our allies and partners around the world uh, are doing. But these are questions for the sovereign state of Ukraine. Yes. Uh, uh, this question. Um, more generally, is it a good idea, is it wise idea to sign something under the Russian shelling? And yes or no, if it ends up uh, signing some kind of agreement, could one expect that the United States will be a part of this agreement? I, I, I missed the first part of your question. It is, a, is it generally a good idea, wise idea to sign a peace agreement during the shelling? Well, uh, we continue to believe that uh, there must be 
a diplomatic resolution uh, to uh, this war. Uh, and that is why we are standing with our Ukrainian partners as they continue to engage in uh, diplomacy, why we've been consulting and coordinating so closely uh, with our French allies, our German allies, our Turkish allies, our Israeli partners, and others uh, who have been involved in various uh, diplomatic efforts to try and bring uh, this brutal war to a close. But we know something else to be true, and that is that diplomacy will have the best chance of success, not in the context of escalation, but in the context of de-escalation. And to your point, we, and to what I said earlier, have not yet seen any indication that President Putin is willing to de-escalate. In fact, uh, we have seen escalation after escalation. Uh, as the Secretary said yesterday, uh, President Putin has continued uh, to put his foot on the accelerator. Uh, it is time to put the brakes on this conflict. It is time to see a diminution of the violence. It is time to see a de-escalation. It is time to see uh, the Russians take steps uh, that spare additional lives. Yeah, uh, let me uh, go around. Okay. Sure. Question: You and and others in the administration have repeatedly spoken about how um, um, united you and your NATO allies allies are. And my question is whether you think this is a permanent resolution of the differences and frictions that came up with NATO and the United States over the last four years, or if this is sort of a unique convergence of events and there still will still be a lot more work to do in terms of U.S. working with NATO? Well, I would make the point that any disagreement or disharmony between the United States and NATO came to a close in January of last year, long before this conflict. Secretary Blinken's uh, first travel to the European continent, you probably recall, was to Brussels. Uh, he went to uh, a NATO ministerial. If I recall his second travel to the continent of Europe was to Brussels, uh, where he attended uh, a NATO ministerial uh, just a few weeks later. So we have demonstrated from the very first hours uh, of this administration when Secretary Blinken spoke to uh, the NATO Secretary General, uh, and of course the President uh, has had uh, conversations uh, as well. Uh, the, the indispensability uh, of the NATO alliance and the fact that to us, NATO's Article 5, the principle that an attack on one is an attack on all, is as sacrosanct today as it was 70 plus years ago uh, when the NATO Charter uh, was signed. Now, I think it is true that the alliance in the buildup and in the wake of Russia's aggression is as united. Um, as focused and as purposeful as it has been since the end of the Cold War. It has uh, really brought into focus uh, the reason for being uh, of the alliance in the first place. I also think, and you can, I'll let countries speak for themselves, uh, but this, this brings, brings up once again the point that President Putin, through his actions, has in fact precipitated everything that he has sought to prevent. And a number of countries that just a few short months ago uh, probably would have uh, uh, demurred if asked about any NATO aspirations uh, have given different answers. Uh, of course, um, I think that the value uh, of NATO, uh, its purpose, its reason for being, uh, today is as in focus as it, as it ever has been. Yes? Uh, uh, Department, per se, but, uh, so today's call between uh, Jake Sullivan and, uh, and General Petrushev, mm -hmm. uh, is this not a, because this is the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first high level contact uh, since, since uh, the beginning of the invasion, so is this not a positive signal or uh, that the sides are you know, coming together, or how are we supposed to interpret that? I, I, I wouldn't quite uh, characterize it in, in, in quite those terms. Uh, I will speak, I won't speak for the White House, uh, they will speak to their own uh, engagements. What I can say 
uh, is that the last time Secretary Blinken had been uh, in contact with his counterpart uh, was uh, in the immediate aftermath of the potential meeting in Geneva uh, coming down. Uh, and this was, of course, right in the midst of the start uh, of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and I say that I might characterize this contact a, a bit differently because as the White House uh, laid out, uh, the National Security Advisor outlined in very clear terms for his counterpart uh, our commitment to continuing to impose costs on the Russian Federation, our commitment to continuing to support uh, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity uh, of our Ukrainian partners. He also took advantage of the conversation uh, to uh, make uh, very clear uh, that um, there would be significant consequences and implications were the Russian Federation to uh, use chemical or biological uh, weapons in Ukraine. Uh, so I think this speaks to the fact that there are some very weighty, uh, very uh, consequential issues uh, that are now uh, on the table. Uh, there are some very weighty concerns uh, that we have. And so we are going to, uh, we are not going to pass up uh, an opportunity to convey those concerns and to convey the potential implications uh, if we think that direct contact uh, is in our interest. Paul. Um, can I go to Iran? Sure. Um, so, well, with the Iranian say there's two issues left, which presumably... They are that they want guarantees from the U.S. and they uh, uh, against uh, another policy change, and uh, they want the IRGC to be cleared of being named a terrorist group. Uh, can those issues be bridged, and do you expect them to be bridged soon? And secondly, uh, can you, what do you think of the Britain's ability to get back its hostages and the coincidental timing of them releasing Iranian funds? Uh, so to your first question, uh, we do think the remaining issues can be bridged. Uh, we do think, and we, as we said before, uh, we have made significant progress. Uh, we are close uh, to a possible deal, but uh, we're not there yet. From our end, we are not going to characterize the number or the nature uh, of these remaining issues precisely because we are at a very delicate stage. Uh, we want to uh, do everything we can to see to it uh, that uh, a mutual, re well, to determine if a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, is in the offing, and it would need to be in the offing in. Uh, the short term. Uh, as we've said, uh, there is uh, little time remaining given the nuclear advancements that uh, Tehran has made uh, that over time would obviate the nonproliferation benefits uh, that the JCPOA uh, conveyed. So this is an issue that needs to be worked urgently. It is an issue uh, that has had our urgent attention for uh, some time now. Uh, we still continue to believe that a mutual return to compliance uh, would be um, manifestly uh, in our interests, and we are going to uh, find out in the near term uh, whether we're able to get there. When it comes to uh, the news you referred to today, uh, let me just say that we welcome the news regarding British citizens Nazanin, Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe and Anush Ashuri. Uh, we, of course, would refer you to our British counterparts for specific questions on their status. When it comes to our efforts, we continue to work night and day to secure the release of our wrongfully detained citizens, and that includes U.S.-U.K. citizen Murad Tabaz. Uh, simply put, uh, Iran is unjustly detaining innocent Americans and others, and Tehran should release them immediately. Securing their release is an utmost priority for this administration. We call upon Iran to make urgent progress toward the release of wrongfully detained U.S. citizens. I can tell you that uh, Special Envoy Malley and Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, uh, Karstens, they have been regularly speaking with the families uh, of our detainees. They'll continue to do so, particularly uh, to pass along the status uh, of uh, any progress to bring their loved, one, loved ones home. In fact, uh, they spoke with the families of all four uh, wrongfully detained U.S. citizens uh, just yesterday. Does the, does the British... Uh, release of, fund, of funds to Iran make it more difficult for you to 
obtain the release of uh, Americans without doing the same kind of gesture? Well, this was a sovereign UK decision. We were not a party uh, to this decision. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that we are going to continue working night and day to do everything we can uh, to bring our citizens home. Yes, Rich. Uh, also, this is my first time in the briefing this week, and I um, want to thank you for your thoughtful words yesterday for the support of the State Department for uh, our colleagues, for uh, Ben, Pierre, and Sasha, uh, and all the support that you've given us. And I know it means a lot to the bullpen, it means a lot to Fox, uh, and it means a lot to me. So uh, thank you for that. Rich, it's, it's why we're here, to, to help uh, to help citizens, to help to help those in need. So um, we've, we've welcomed the, the, the good news. We hope to hear more of it. Great. Thank you. Um, Moving on to uh, an Iran question, um, uh, there's a report in Axios that the administration is considering removing the IRGC from the FTO list in return to, for a public commitment from Iran uh, to de-escalate in the region. Is that something that uh, you can confirm? It's not something I can speak to. Uh, it's not something I can speak to beyond the fact that there are two key issues at the heart of these negotiations. On the one hand, you have uh, the nuclear commitments that Tehran uh, would need to adhere to uh, were it to resume full compliance with the JCPOA. On the other side of, of the ledger, you have uh, the sanctions relief that uh, the United States, uh, working with our P5 plus one uh, partners, would be prepared uh, to provide if we were to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, so the issue of sanctions relief is really and has been at the heart uh, of these negotiations, uh, but we're just not going to speak to specifics at this stage. Does the IRGC's missile launches near an American consulate change that calculation? And with that in mind, does, does the administration still think it would be appropriate for that to even be considered? What it underscores for us is the fact that Iran poses a threat to our allies, to our partners, in some cases to the United States across a range of of realms. Uh, the most urgent challenge we would face is a nuclear armed Iran or an Iran that was on the very precipice of obtaining a nuclear weapon. Every challenge that we face and would face from Iran, uh, whether that is its support for proxies, its support for terrorist groups, its ballistic missile program, all of those challenges uh, would become all the more difficult to confront uh, if Iran were in the possession of a nuclear weapon. Iran would be able to act with far greater impunity uh, if it were in possession of a nuclear weapon. So uh, we are determined uh, to continue to confront uh, all of those threats working in tandem with our allies uh, and partners, uh, just as we are determined to take that central potential threat off the table, uh, the threat of an Iranian nuclear weapon. That is what we are seeking to do by testing the proposition that through a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, uh, we can reimpose the permanent, verifiable uh, limits on Iran's nuclear program to see to it that Iran is never able to acquire a nuclear weapon. Um, is the administration committed, if there is an agreement, to um, submitting an agreement to congressional review and waiting out the 30-day period before lifting any sanctions? Well, what I can say at, at this point, Rich, we obviously don't have uh, an agreement of any sort, but we will carefully consider the facts and circumstances of any U.S. return to the JCPOA to determine the legal implications, including those under ANARA. Uh, we're committed to ensuring the uh, requirements of ANARA are fully satisfied. Uh, the president believes that a bipartisan approach across our foreign policy, and we've been heartened, we've been heartened to see this uh, on a number of issues recently, including on Ukraine, uh, with a $13.6 billion in appropriations, a large chunk of which we spoke to today. But we believe that a bipartisan approach uh, to our foreign policy, including to Iran, uh, is the strongest way to safeguard uh, U.S. interests in the long term. Uh, and we have reached out at all levels to members of Congress and their staffs to discuss our approach to Iran this very week. Uh, there have continued uh, to be briefings uh, on the Hill. Special Envoy Mali, Brett McGurk at the White House, uh, others are deeply committed to uh, this continued close engagement uh, with Congress in a, bipart in a bipartisan manner uh, during uh, the negotiations uh, and for whatever comes next. Uh, it should sound as though we are committed to ensuring the requirements of ANARA are fully satisfied. But that doesn't mean we should mitigate. I mean, that's not a that's not a pledge to yeah, submit I, it to that as, through as, that review process. As, as, as I said before, we don't have a deal. 
Um, this is this is a hypothetical, but uh, if and when there is any sort of agreement, we are committed to ensuring the requirements of an are fully satisfied. Yesterday, you were a bit circumspect about um, Foreign Minister Lavrov's comments with the Iranian Foreign Minister at their meeting in Moscow, in which he said uh, you know, he talked. To, he suggested his comments appeared to suggest at least that the the last minute Russian objections or their concerns about you know, Ukraine sanctions essentially bleeding over into the JCPOA. Uh, that those were resolved. Um, you said that you didn't think there was really, really ever an issue in the first place. But have you gotten any more clarity um, from, not directly from the Russians, presumably, but through anyone else, that 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 is that it is this issue is in fact now resolved, and the Russians won't blow a deal up. Well, what I will say is that. Uh, we have spoken to a very small number of outstanding issues. Uh, in addition to, call it what you will, I think uh, Mr. Burrell called it external factors. Right. So there have been external factors in addition to outstanding issues. Even if these external factors are fully resolved and uh, without speaking to them in detail, we've seen uh, the comments from uh, senior Russian officials that would uh, seem to suggest uh, that they are in a different place, have been in, di in a different place over the past couple of days, and they might have been a few days before that. Uh, even if uh, external factors are removed, uh, we still have some ways to go uh, until and unless we're able Understood. to. Uh, but as far as you, as far as your your understanding is that those external factors are now reduced or no longer there. I, these external factors were not about us in the first place, so it would not be. Okay. Uh, our place to comment on whether they're resolved or not. And then I think I can probably guess your answer to this question, but I just want to know today is that today is the day that you're supposed to, that the Secretary is supposed to make a determination as to whether to continue the uh, protection for former Secretary Pompeo and Special Envoy Hook. Um, has he done that? Uh, and if he has, what, what did he decide? Well, uh, Matt, we don't discuss the specifics of uh, protective operations. Uh, as you know, Congress has approved authorities that allow the Department of State to protect former or retired senior department officials if the Secretary, in consultation with the Director of National Intelligence, determines that the official faces a credible threat from a foreign power uh, or the agent of a foreign power arising specifically from duties that that former official uh, pursued while employed by the Department of State. And so under Section 7071 of the Appropriations Act, uh, again, the Secretary in consultation uh, with the DNI determines and then reports to congressional leadership and the appropriate congressional committees uh, if a former or, or a retired senior State Department official would receive uh, protection. We have up to $30 million uh, in appropriated funds to be made available if such a determination is made. Uh, but I think you can understand why we wouldn't speak publicly uh, to whether we have made such a determination as that would um, potentially pose a, a security issue. Well, not only would it potentially pose a security mm -hmm. issue, but it would also be a problematic if you were to lift a FTO designation against the IRGC when they're in fact, if you determine that, they, that the threats that they have made to those two men uh, continue to exist. You heard from the National Security Advisor, it's a statement he issued, I believe, on January 9th, uh, where he made uh, crystal clear uh, that any effort to uh, harm a U.S. citizen, be it on U.S. soil, anywhere in the world, uh, whether that uh, person uh, was a former official, current official of any party. It is something we would take extraordinarily, extraordinarily seriously. Uh, there is nothing we take uh, with more uh, gravity than the protection, uh, the safety of uh, U.S. citizens. So uh, uh, I, will, I will leave it at that. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, kind of, kind of come back to to Ukraine, um, uh, but specifically the meeting that the National Security Advisor held with his Chinese counterpart in Rome. Um, Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink, you, you said you said was there. He's now returned uh, to Washington, I believe, and I, I guess had time to, to debrief you, you on that or debrief the department on that. Um, is there anything more you can tell us about? Um, you know. We understand the message that was that was given in that meeting that there are these concerns about China supporting Russia's uh, war in Ukraine. But um, you know, at the conclusion of the meeting or, or, or coming out of that meeting, um, what's your reading on what China's um, view is going forward on on supporting Russia in Ukraine and whether they're giving material support? 
So it's not for us uh, to characterize what the PRC view on this or any other issue uh, may be or is. It is for us to characterize the messages that were conveyed uh, very clearly uh, in the course of our diplomacy. And as I indicated two days ago now, uh, one of the reasons, probably the most important reason, uh, we convene at high levels with our PRC counterparts is to ensure that those lines of communication remain open. This is probably the most consequential bilateral relationship on uh, the face of the earth. It is incumbent upon us uh, as a responsible country uh, to see to it that the competition that uh, characterizes our relationship doesn't veer into the realm of conflict. Uh, and of course, dialogue and discussion is, is part of that. When it comes to the PRC's approach to Russia and Ukraine, uh, a number of countries, uh, the vast majority of the world's countries, have stood up uh, with and for our Ukrainian partners. They have stood up against uh, President Putin's aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, we have yet to see those that sort of unambiguous uh, statement from uh, the PRC or that sort of unambiguous support uh, from the PRC. And we've made very clear uh, to the PRC that we have significant concerns uh, in that uh, any effort to compensate Russia for its financial losses, for the economic toll, or, of course, any effort to supply, to provide uh, materiel, for Russia's war effort, uh, that would be met with significant costs, uh, not only from the United States, but from uh, our allies and partners uh, around the world. Sweet. Those are the messages that were conveyed. Uh, it is not up to us to uh, characterize uh, any sort of PRC response. You said, you said you've yet to see an unambiguous um, statement from, from the Chinese. Have you seen any uh, signal or any indication since that meeting uh, from the Chinese of, of what their position might, you know, is there any change to their position? I, I, I will leave it to our PRC counterparts to speak to their position. Yes, sir. Xavier to Venezuela. Sure. Uh, after the trip to Caracas of a senior U.S. delegation to meet with government, with the government of President Nicolas Maduro, uh, is the U.S. still recognizing Juan Guaidó as the interim president? Uh, are you planning a follow-up meetings with Maduro? And uh, are you concerned that this kind of meetings weaken the Venezuelan opposition? Uh, well, as we talked about a couple days ago, the visit to Venezuela focused on really two things, and that was securing the release of wrongful detainees uh, and urging the Maduro regime to return to the negotiating table in Mexico uh, with uh, the democratic opposition's unitary platform to restore democracy in Venezuela. So far from undermining uh, Juan Guaido, it actually reinforced uh, our support for uh, interim president Juan Guaido and his call for a negotiated solution uh, through the Mexico process. There, of course, has been no change uh, in our recognition of interim president Juan, Gu Juan Guaido's uh, role. We will continue to uh, work with him as such. We will continue to uh, urge uh, the resumption of negotiations through the through the Mexico City process. Does it mean a recognition that uh, who's in power is like Nicolás Maduro and not Juan Guaido because the delegation didn't uh, go to the house of Juan Guaido. He went to meet uh, Maduro officials. In one way, it was a recognition that it was the Maduro regime that was and continues to hold Americans unjustly against their will. It, of course, was not Juan Guaido uh, or the unitary platform uh, that held and continues to hold unjustly American detainees. So if we seek the return of Americans who are held unjustly against their will, uh, in that case, uh, we met with the party that was holding them. Thank you all very much.